Okay, hello. Good morning, everybody. Welcome as you're joining us for our very special 30 year anniversary event featuring Dr. Michelle Veneziano and Gina Bria and our CAHS trustee, Anne Marie Cushing. Our topic this morning is hydration and conscious movement. And we are so excited to dive into this really special program. It's going to be exciting, and I'm really excited for it personally. Uh, my name is Nicole Ryle. And I'm the Director of Development and Public Programs here at CIHS. CIHS Enlighten is the uh, sector of our institution that offers certificate programs, continuing education, and community offerings. And we are delighted this morning to continue this series. Um, throughout this year, we've been hosting uh, distinguished and inspiring guests that like, like our ones here today. So, Without further ado, let's get going. Um, I would love to introduce you to our CIHS president, Dr. Thomas Brophy. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you. Okay, yes, welcome to this very special CIHS 30th anniversary special live event. And I'm just extremely delighted to be able to introduce today's three featured presenters all three of our presenters today are very much connected with CIHS's mission and the philosophy of CIHS's founder, Dr. Hiroshi Motoyama. Anne-Marie Cushing is a visionary architect, educator, and advocate for health reform. She's an advisor to national and international health organizations, providing leadership and strategic envisioning of health reform, she served as co-chair of the executive committee and board of the famous and extraordinary New York Open Center. Most fortunately for us at CIHS, Anne Marie is also a trustee of CIHS. Dr. Michelle Veneziano is an extraordinary light being, and as well, she is a family physician, intuitive, and clinical professor. She's a practitioner of Continuing Movement, Yoga, Buddhism, Tai Chi, and Tantric Practices. Her practice of osteopathic medicine is based on cranial osteopathy, a hands-on, evidence-based therapeutic practice that sources both Western and Eastern philosophies to support the body's ability to heal itself. She is board certified in family medicine. She has served as staff physician at major hospitals. And anthropologist Gina Bria is a renowned scholar, researcher, and consultant in the field of hydration strategies for health and agriculture. In 2021, she received a very cool award, the 10-year Buckminster Fuller Design Sciences Studio Award. She's recently been named knowledge partner with the U.S. State Department. Gina founded the hydrationfoundation.org to promote optimal hydration for people, plants, and regolus or soils. I use the planetary science term regolus to expand the vision there a little bit for soils. And this morning, with Anne-Marie serving as moderator, they will be presenting on the fascinating topic, hydration and consciousness movement, hydration and conscious movement. Anne-Marie, are you speaking? Ah, okay. I thought we were going into our meditation. Oh, um, but we can do that. We can do that. <laughs> Absolutely. I was already in my meditation mode. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for those beautiful introductions. I'm just tuning into my body right now. I'm feeling so much excitement and humming uh, moving up my spine and and actually what I'd love to do with us this morning is start to get actually position us in our seats I don't I don't actually speak to position so much because we don't consider ourselves uh, nouns we consider ourselves verbs uh, that we consider we that we are movement versus that we do movement and as we move into this practice together with the intention to arrive in this space connected and coherent, what we're really doing is yielding to the wave motion that is attempting to express itself and ignite life in our bodies in every moment. And so simply one of the things that really supports yielding to native 
fluid motion is to unweight the central axis, what we call in osteopathy, the midline, the central channel, the um, chakral tree. And And a simple way to do that is to begin to consciously move the weight of your body often forward off your sit bones or towards uh, the front of your sit bones. And one way to accomplish this is to move possibly to the front of your seat or take a pillow and fill in the hole uh, in the back of your chair. Most chairs do not facilitate this arriving of this very powerful vertical circuit through the center of the body. And you're looking for, hmm, where is it that I might sit, that I can begin to feel some kind of luscious serpent-like expression begin to come through. Feeling your feet on the ground is very potent in beginning to activate the line. We're talking about a very literal electrical circuit between the planet and the ionosphere that we can now collectively log on to and be moved and energized by and also have the water in our bodies activated by this waveform. So tuning into the surfaces that you're contacting and the sense of gravity meeting you and supporting you and allowing you to soften, even dissolve a little bit. Allowing your crown to reach for the sky above and a sense of as the substance nature of our beings arrives in our awareness that the fluid of your midline is beginning to lengthen lengthen from the crown toward the sky and root into the ground from below And noticing if simply attending to those two poles begins to reflect in the body as possibly some heat or some tingling. And the broadening of our awareness to include the entire body as well as the space around us. And in a sense of the space we share in this moment begins to it's our own it's our awareness coming in and including all of it that begins to wake it up have it inflate and become full and buoyant as though we're stalks of seaweed in a kelp forest swaying in concert on the bottom of the ocean floor I'm actually feeling for a coherence, a connectivity coming in. Ah. And continuing to allow your awareness to track or notice without staring how it is that your tissues might be feeling a little bit more hydrated in this moment. Allowing the electricity that comes in as a function of our awareness and attention to ignite the water molecules in the body and allow them to do their work of conducting electricity. Okay. Staying where we are, the intention that we actually remain Uh, entrained, um, coordinated in connection with each other and in breath and motion, establishing ourselves in a baseline of um, receiving. Now we're inflating. We're actually going to be hydrating through this entire hour together. And and even though we're speaking to continue to tune into how it is that I'm actually filling up. 
So the first thing that we want to offer is a film that Gina, Bria, and Maxi Cohen put together to describe a beautiful water project that we're doing collectively to further consciousness on the meaning of water in the context of personal and global health. So we're going to show that to you, and then we're going to springboard into some conversation and then ultimately include you in the conversation. Water is far more abundant than we thought. Water is hidden around us everywhere. Water isn't only blue, it's also green, found inside all living plants. It's brown, too, occupying volume in soils, roots, fungi, mycelium. Water runs all living systems. It's everywhere. We think of water as liquid, vapor, or even ice. But the most abundant form of water is in a form we are only just identifying, the gel-like or plasma state found in all cells. And we ourselves are far more made of water than we thought. Let me show you. Let me take you inside yourself and show you the first living images we've ever had of water inside the body. This is a video from Dr. Jean-Claude Jean Barteau showing what our living tissues actually look like close up. See how much we are water how water repairs and rejoins our tissues, water in both liquid and plasma form, transporting not only hydration, but energy. The fuel for living is actually water. Water energy runs all life. See how the web-like connective material, so gossamer, so beautiful, actually holds us together. It's a network of building material and fuel transport at the same moment. And it's doing a third task. This plasma-like, gel-like network is receiving and sending information, bioelectric, biochemical, making water actually digital, making hydration our interface between the world inside us and the world outside us. But water must be in motion to do its work. Wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful. So Gina, you know, you mentioned that water must be in motion for it to, to interface and to connect. So what I'd love for us to all come together and, and have a conversation about is how water and hydration and uh, motion and, and osteopathy have come together and how you have uh, both come together with your work and what this brings basically to the values of both of your individual missions, but also for the work that you're going to be presenting at the end of January for the course study. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm happy to say every time I see this film, I still have that flood of wonder that we can look inside the human body. And to find out that we're made of water is just, <laughs> is just an amazing fact. And again, I remember going to bed the night that I was, saw these original research films coming out of France, uh, laying down and thinking, I, I'm different now that I've seen that. I understand something about myself that I didn't know before. My identity shifted and I recognized how powerful it was to understand myself as a water being, right? That, 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 that that's what I look like inside. And how did it take us so long to find that out? I think um, many indigenous traditions already were working with this knowledge, but for us, it became much more reductionist. So, um, and because, of course, I study hydration and hydration strategies as an anthropologist all over the globe, and I look at how, to, especially how hydration is accomplished in, in desert conditions without liquid available, open liquid, usually very scarce. 
I thought that as I was working through that information, the most interesting thing people would want to know, it was like the urgent question it, I heard from every single person would be, how much should I, should I be drinking? How much should I be drinking? <laughs> What's the amount of water I should be drinking to, to, and of course, there's the old, you know, saw that it's eight glasses a day. And when I saw that desert people weren't, didn't have eight glasses a day and they weren't guzzling water the way we are taught in our culture, that fi finding water in desert conditions and finding out how many plants carry water and how much food is carried, how much food is part of our water chain that we're we're missing that as part of the conversation. It, the next step after that, Anne Marie, was re recognizing that no one is putting motion together, movement with hydration, and it is absolutely essential that the water must move. That all of that tissue that we were seeing in those incredibly thin and beautiful um, uh, strands of uh, hydration and tissue and uh, connective tissue, all of that. Um, is activated by movement. And if we just have the conversation about how much we throw in our gullet and we don't understand that it's about the distribution and the whole liveliness of movement that creates a completely different level of, uh, of occupying ourselves. So for me, it became more interesting and more urgent to talk about the relationship between movement and hydration then about the how much or what to drink or how to get it. That that's right. That's where I landed on that conversation. Yeah, and maybe Michelle, you can tell us on the physiological basis in terms of movement, you know, related to water, you know, not just on a metaphorical basis, but a real physiological basis too. Oh, thank you, Anne Marie. Uh, the things I'm thinking about on the heels of receiving that gorgeous sharing from Gina. Uh, I'm touching into my own wonder because I really feel that we're on uh, an edge of discovery. It's like, it, this is, this is, we have so many studies that show that movement is, supports health, and um, we're going to talk about a few of those. And we don't have studies that talk about conscious movement, presence coupled with movement, and how the awareness and attention of our own consciousness entering the body, remaining in the body as we conjured in the meditation this morning to me is like it, because I can track these things I'm, I'm I'm my own living research laboratory I and when I move consciously and I tune into sensation in my tissues it feels like I'm sparking a match and lighting up this current of electricity through the body which then we experience as waking up potentially dormant water molecules, you know, without electricity, water's kind of in stasis. It's not, as Gina just named so much, participating in that aliveness expression. The electricity comes in, this is very much movement and consciousness based, and then current begins to run through the body. And then literally, uh, in my practice, as I began to discover this, in myself, in my own conscious movement practices, such as continuum movement, qigong, tai chi, I would feel the electricity move and then we can actually observe the skin expand and the evidence of blood flow come in in the form of rosiness in the cheeks. And of course, this is all coupled with expansion in every area of the body, including the organs and the chakras. And so we have... I'm just naming something I haven't thought of, hydration as uh, it's evidence of the, com, becoming alive and coming into connection with our hearts, because we know the heart organizes the coherence state in the body. So now I'm thinking, well, you know, water comes to life in the con under the conditions of coherence. The heart drives coherence. The heart is... Uh, intensely involved with movement there's a there are more papers to be written you mentioned that water comes to life that the, the you know our hydration does through this conscious moment and i know that uh, gina you have perhaps a film that you would like to show us another film or actually you do actually oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. this is actually the perfect time to show this i want to preamble I've been practicing continuum movement. We're about to see a film of bodies being water, a short film. 
and for probably almost 20 years now, I'm not an authorized continuum instructor. However, the practices of continuum movement and osteopathy have been coupled for many, many years. My dear mentor, Bonnie Gintis, wrote a gorgeous book, uh, which includes a whole chapter on water, naming a lot of the early science that she was aware of way back in 2006, I think, when she initiated that book. And we're basically about to see bodies becoming movement and becoming fluid. And in osteopathy, we, we, we work with the body as if it's a substance. Substances do not hold strain patterns. If we can arrive in that place of integration between the physical and subtle body, which is a very heart-present state of coherence, the body begins to reorganize spontaneously, as is its nature, as is all of our nature, when we're truly connected and coherent. And so what we're about to see is both Emily Conrad and Susan Harper moving their bodies in a meditative state. It's not intentional. It's a yielding to, receiving of, being moved by the natural wave motion of life expressed in the body. So let's go ahead and see that. Teacher Susan Harper, and here we're looking at what happens when the spine returns once again to its fluid origins. We have to remember that bone is connective tissue and that it is filled with fluid. The movements of undulations, arcs, spirals, will stimulate the fluid. Any movement that behaves like fluid will make it more vibrant and more potent. And what we're seeing is the choreography of the fluid as it is moving through the connective tissue called bone. We have to remember that bone began in the ocean in the first place. And so the dexterity of our skeletal structure is primordial and is um, this is how bone maintains its health. It's through its flexibility and its adaptability and dexterity. So we're watching the choreography of the fluid as it's articulating itself through this beautiful, complex spinal movement. Okay, now I'm going to narrate because I think it's important to realize that that amount of movement is extraordinary. It's not something I've attempted or accomplished. And what we speak to and what is possible in every moment and what we condition ourselves to accomplish in every moment of the class that we're going to be teaching is remaining in respiration. It's really a full body breathing class that has everything to do with movement and hydration in this subtle surrendering to our fluid nature, which I'm doing in this moment. I'm doing it imperceptibly when I'm standing in line at the bank or when I'm walking on trail. There's always a possibility of resting in what I now am naming a hydrating behavior in the welcoming of the expression, the full expression of vital energy potently in every cell in our bodies, we're actually creating a piezoelectric effect. This allows cells to expand. There are magnetic and electrical fields associated with our attention, breath, possibly sound interacting with our cells in a constant state of resonance and expansion. This is hydration. Hydration is a behavior. It's a receptivity. And it doesn't come from the mind state. Right. So the, if hydration is a behavior, then tell us more, though, and maybe Gina can come in, too, to the, this factor as well. Give us more of a, an idea of how this expresses itself for everyday existence. Michelle, do you want me to go yeah, forward okay. with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think the big aha for me was discovering that all living cells are little Ziploc bags of water. They're little, you know, tiny little pockets of water. Because when 
people asking how much should they drink, they're really thinking of it, the whole fluid system and guzzling uh, wetness, and then that kind of gets osmosis. And that's sort of the end of their chain of thinking about it and not actually uh, going to the next level, understanding that our cells themselves, and this is why as an anthropologist, I was so astounded by all this information. Every living cell, all creatures, all plants, <laughs> everything that's alive, all living cells are these packets of water. And they are they're in this gel-like form. And of course, they're surrounded by liquids. We still have liquid forms in us. And that this knowledge that I'm sharing this experience of all other living things, you know, I can't go buy a plant leaf without kissing it now. <laughs> I, have, like, I have my little plant right here next to me because I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm sharing this knowledge mm -hmm. now, it's quite different, which is that that we are all, you know, uh, assemblages of these tiny packets of water. And that if we were aware of that and living that, we would start perceiving more powerfully. We would receive more information. We would broadcast more information so that the level of potential for living changes when, you, when we get you this essential information. And to start that conversation, what I try to just say very simply is we all know that, that water conducts electricity. I mean, everybody knows that, but we hadn't connected that to our own subtle systems of water moving and create water creating electrical flow in us so that we're more alive. We're literally more alive than we were before we knew this. And that that, that aliveness is expressed in motion. Like the next thing that happens once we have those awarenesses is, is a motion in our system. Mm. That's saying yes. a lot. I'll, I'll let Michelle. Yeah. Yeah. And Michelle, what do you think in terms of, you know, just your work as an osteopath? Yeah, thank you. I, now I want to answer your question about grounding in physiology, because uh, to tie it all together with the film that we just saw and my poetic words about, you know, consciousness and connecting our attention, this is actually literal and measurable. Um, Gina's bringing in of the picture of the image of the cell as these water packets and when consciousness, electricity, activated by movement and our attention connected with our cells, cells comes in, there's more electricity in the water. This literally changes its surface tension. It lowers the surface tension of the water, which then allows it to permeate cell wall, do all of this cleansing of the internal cellular space as well as activate, you know, the right signaling molecules and the release of toxins. The movement and the consciousness are literally actually allowing the water to penetrate our cells and support as though the, the body is a garden, the tending of, nourishing of, nutrifying of this terrain, which is very similar to soil. Yeah, and also both of you are so community driven too in terms of your work, you know, how it, it manifests out there in the world. So Gina and, and both Michelle, tell us more in terms of how this kind of work brings in the community aspect, and why it's so important that the work manifests itself with a commune dyna dynamic. I love that because now we get back to the whole anthropology of all of this for me of how we are connected to the people around us both biologically, so you get to really say, biologically, we are made of the same material and we're vibrating information back and forth. Once you become aware that somebody else is that body of water as you are, there's, there's a kinship as we fall in love with the, the soils and the plants and the microbiome and all the other things that are made of water our appreciation and our love for them increases. I think that, you know, I think one of my moments came when I started saying, uh, you know, it's the, the water as a greeting, the water in me greets the water in you. There is this, this sort of <laughs> new level of fellowship, of, of connection. So I think one of the most important things about understanding yourself as a body of water and understanding other people 
as a body of water as well, is if you're already operating on this conception, you're aware of flow and the relationship that you're in now is a mobile one. It's in movement. And you're aware that of floods of information coming through. You're, you're responding to that. For me, it's helped me be much more able to, to flow in, in groups and in my own communities of just sort of attentive listening and ready for that generosity that comes from knowing that there's a, you know, a standard thing of which we're all experiencing. Helping people get to understanding themselves as bodies of water creates resiliency in, in each person because mm-hmm. it, you know, whatever's coming in, it's going to flow in and be processed and flow out. You are a liquid dynamic system and you can roll with it. You know, like what is the Bruce Lee quote where he says, be like water, my friend, <laughs> you know, we're, I think in terms of trying to urge people to understand themselves as bodies of water, is a Buckminster Fuller idea, which is could this, we are allowed them to be more collaborative, more about being a participant in the circle and uh, what we're contributing to that. And I think that's where our urgent solutions are going to be found for how we're going to solve our, our next round of concern about the planet and species that are disappearing and the sad and widespread ill health among our fellow humans. It's, it's astounding, and I think hydration and water and movement are the, the path out for that. Beautiful. And Michelle, you want to continue with that? Yeah, so interesting. We're talking about how movement actually creates hydration, and I want to turn it around to how it is that hydration creates movement. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. As inspired from what you just shared, Gina, because it's It really is water is the source of conducting the electricity of our consciousness that might have us wake up and actually be able to be in service on the planet in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And I'm recalling the words of Dr. Zach Bush, which many of us know because he's such a champion of true health and and ecosystems of the planet and the body. And I was so amused when he named, you know, this triple board certified research physician that if we're not hydrated, we're not going to be a spiritual. He qualified that statement. Mm-hmm. He said, it's going to sound strange, but, and we know that water conducts electricity. And if you're actually dehydrated, you're not going to be aware enough to connect with and understand the power of community and move toward pooling our collective inspiration and skills and gifts toward moving the world to a better place. So I'm going to, I want to tie that into osteopathy. And then I want to tie it into more of a global perspective. Firstly, yes, we're fluids. We work a lot on the fluid level. And then there are times when we flip it and we go, oh, the structure is now going to allow for the fluid to happen, right? Sometimes we come from the feminine aspect Then we read the body and it says, please engage with me as a structure in this moment so I can show up to support this expression of a fluid state. We are talking about rendering water capable of conducting electricity and that this is something we can do with our own awareness. It's why we pray over food. Our own awareness can affect coherence in the water, in the food, and create something harmonious to nourish our bodies with and of course we all know the work of Masaru Omoto and it's very um, much shown that our consciousness is actually able to shift the state of water measurably there are so many beautiful images and so out in the world one of the things Gina and I have been working on for years now is Okay, so you have all these farms, you have all these ways that we want to create healthier agriculture and respond to the water shortage. So one of the things that we're doing is working with how it is that technology can mimic this effect of conscious consciousness on water. And it, the science is so simple. We have these various different sizes. We have these massive units that are Uh, applicable to agricultural uses. And what they do is they contain compressed marbles of mineral composite that mimic stones in a river. And in nature, water flowing over these smooth surfaces is like this sparking of, it's like this 
bringing of electricity into the water, which by the way, goes away when it runs through pipes in your home, right? So we also have devices that like, you're not home to consciously structure the water in your house, but you can have a unit that mimics water flowing over a stream uh, so that you can be using that water for drinking and cooking and gardening and showering and obviously for farms so that we begin to actually, I have this image of reconstituting well, so many bodies that I treat, I feel them and they're like, what's happening here? This is like, this is like freeze dried food on a camping trip. We need to actually rehydrate, bring this person to life so that they can actually attune to what is their role here? How is it that they want to serve? How is it that their inspiration can come through in service of humanity in this time of actually needing to move to somewhere different than we really are? Uh, and Gina and I share this. We see it. We're like, oh, we're already there. We just have these, these few pieces that need to come in and have people really wake up to the significance, the meaning of becoming hydrated, awake beings and that film that we showed is really, it's a preview to a traveling water museum that's going to be showcasing all the science and, you know, really giving people the experience of the true meaning of consciousness and water. Yeah. Michelle, if I can c carry forward. Yes, please. We just said uh, water conducts electricity and that helps you kind of get a different sense a, le a new level of understanding that the water inside of you is doing the work of keeping you alive of making you a living thing by virtue of transferring this electricity or sending this electricity or increasing the electricity now i want to shift the conversation just one more step which is to talk about water as information so the strange and glorious thing that we're newly discovering is that water carries information this is profound. We didn't know that water, whatever it touches, absorbs and picks up as if it were quantum, as if it were a quantum computer, which I work with these water scientists around the world. And they're always being buttonholed by people from Silicon Valley. Like, how can we make a water? How can we make a, a computer that functions like water molecules do? Because we know water molecules when they move, they move into uh, states of alignment, begin um, creating, sharing, and storing information. So now if we're moving the conversation from just, oh, get hydrated because you'll ele your electricity will go up and you'll be a more conscious person or a more fluid person or a more graceful person or a more connected and coercive person, now we can move the conversation to the next level, which is, oh my God, water is information coming in. And it's archived information. So <laughs> being in the presence of water that's uh, got its alignment, that is capable of storing as much information as silicon. Wow, now we understand that hydration is about receiving and uh, contributing to information or let's in the, in the, um, indigenous traditions that would be called wisdom. It's, this is this is extraordinary stuff. It's like, okay, if you try to, you know, try to share that with your colleagues in the biology department. It's, it is not easy, but I think we are at, as you open this by saying, we are at the beginning. We're at the edge of an extraordinary new paradigm. And I especially love the work of Paul Stemitz and the fantastic Fungi because they're doing with the conversation around mushrooms and what mushrooms are doing on the world in terms of sharing information around the world underground. This is, this is, it's a picture. It's not a um, analogy. It's, tr it's the truth about the same thing that's happening inside of us. So when you saw that original film we did right at the beginning, you open up and you see all this very fine netting network webbing. It, you can do a microscopic photograph of that's called fascia or connective tissue and you put it next to the mycelium under the ground and they're exactly the same system. And what's so important to understand is that it's an information network. Mm -hmm. So back to the question about community, which 
now we're now we get that we are part of an information network by virtue of being water beings. By the way, we didn't mention, we didn't say, by molecular count, the human body is 99% water molecules. I mean, we have to shift and understand we're water beings. Walk, we're walking around on, <laughs> we have bones and we're on land, but literally we're water beings with bones stuck into us to be able to stump around on land. <laughs> <You know? laughs> We're like jellyfish with bones that are moving. And we're, until we get back that knowledge about ourselves, we're clunking around, operating at very low levels of chronic, whatever, depression, inflammation, pick, you know, until we get this idea that we're actually water beings and that hydration and electrical function and new information coming in and sharing information with the soil getting information from trees, you know, forest bathing, being in the presence of uh, plant medicine or plant, um, plants, house plants, house plants. <laughs> this is a lot to take in, but, but if we can land today for all of you that you are a water being and you can be playing with the possibility of becoming more buoyant, more buoyant and more buoyant. There's not an end to this. There's not an end to information that's coming in that can construct who we are and make us more of who we are. Then, then we're living a different, we're living ready for the next round of what we need to be. Beautiful. I have a few thoughts that came. I had this vision of bone coming in and and I know, and depending on the study that you look at, bone is actually 35 to 40% water depending on the specimen. And then we know I don't consider bone solid at all. There are mineral matrices within bone and there are also fat cells and blood vessels and lymphatic channels. And they're so potentially wave transmissible. They're very remodelable even late in life if there's enough electricity moving through the bones as we see in these hundred plus year old yogis and Qigong masters that move like water this idea that the information piece where yes when the body is awake yes when we're hydrated we're actually com computers mimic what we can exchange in terms of information with one another our guidance our ability to communicate non-verbally which is a, a very essential native skill uh, which anthropologically speaking was how at one time we read what the weather was doing and knew where the predators were and where we needed to plant and how we could really live in harmony with the cycles of nature uh, and so we're naming something that seems so revolutionary and esoteric and for me this is who we are. This is who we are. We already know it. And so, so my whole training is training. It's sort of, sort of um, not even I'm looking for the word. I'm calling it a learning and healing experience mm -hmm. is hydrating, waking up, thawing the body so that we begin, we can begin to reconnect with these native ways of being. I don't even want to call them skills. This is, this is who we are. This deeply fluid, intensely intelligent, powerful beings that have limitless capacity for connection and, co and communication. I was just going to say, I know when we walk outside, we immediately feel better. We're, we're receiving huge, huge broadcasts of information from the clouds, from the, the angle of the sun, from mm -hmm. uh, the trees that surround us, from the soil underneath our feet. Um, this, is, uh, this is our native state. This is our true biology. And because we live as moderns inside and immobile, um, transferred around by cars and buses and planes, and um, we're most of the time severed from sunshine, which is a huge source of information on how to run the body through the cycle of the day and moonscapes, which tell the all living, the whole earth is getting information except us. 
<laughs> we're out. How are we out of the, the, the loop? But we are. And part of it is because we live inside and so severed from, and we eat, you know, poor foods and take pharmaceuticals. And so, okay, all of those things are true, but what can we do? What can we do to activate this powerful, you know, broadcasting being that we are? And, um, and in this class, in this course as a whole, we're trying to share what those techniques might be that draw us back into our, our native self or our natural self or a higher self that to help us move. And, and, and movement is, a, is essential to this. And I hope we can open the conversation now around what kind of movement? Are we talking about exercise, which is a word I hate and I've never <laughs> seen used in a native tradition. <laughs> we're just, we have to exercise because we're moderns that live in you know, <laughs> compromised environments, right? But movement and even collective movement, like when you get with a group of people and they start to dance together, you see this in many contexts of ceremony where they ultimately sink. It's extraordinary. It's just, in, this is joyous. It's just joyous to be synced, you know, like, a, like wheels running side by side. And these movements that are percussive, walking, dancing, um, when we do Tai Chi, or I'm, I'm going to show you too, just a technique right now where, you know, when you um, twist your arm, you're, you're wringing out your muscle structure and that connective tissue that we saw, you're tensing it, and then you release. And these are, these are pump systems in our whole body, which change our hydration status. And so movement can be as simple as getting some, some spinal twists in during your day where you look over your shoulder, you use your chair to help guide, you know, some, some movement throughout your day. But you're now that you're aware that you're this living tissue uh, that can be twisted and effectively change your cognitive ability, your, your mood and your emotion, your ability to be with other people. That's, it's very simple, really. It's a very, because we're simple beings, but we just didn't know that we're so disconnected. I know, Gina, that you mentioned something before everyone came on. It's something about fidgeting and how that plays an important part. Yeah, this whole exploration of movement and hydration led me into some studies on fidgeting that were done in the UK where they, they looked at, it was a large scale study. I think it was maybe 8,000 women. And they found that women who fidgeted had a reduced more, all mortality rate. And I know as a young girl growing up, I was a I, you know, I was always told to sit down, stop talking, you know, stop moving. And it turns out that even very small motion sets up the whole system because if it's a fluid system, you can think of it like a, a, a maybe a, a paper boat on a pond, that a little toy boat that you're, when you just touch that small motion, it uh, sends out continual movement. So fidgeting is another word for what fidgeting is sort of we michelle and i were kicking this back and forth because fidgeting is sort of an anxiety movement people who fidget because they need more than than this environment is providing for them this is not doing enough for them as a living creature and we were talking about one how important it is to know that fidgeting the smallest movement activates it's valuable just the smallest movement one small movement I do all the time because of our culture, you know, we're, we're locked inside and so forth. But whenever I'm on a Zoom or on my phone, especially on my phone, I'm, I'm constantly nodding. If, <laughs> and people think I'm just a very affirming person that I'm really just doing synovial flushes down the entire back of my spine. <laughs> it does make me more generous and more attentive and I listen better. But what I'm really doing, that chin to chest movement is an entire synovial flush down the back of your, what spinal canal, like keyword there, clue, a canal is, you know, part of this story. So yeah, movement fidgeting, but then Michelle and her brilliance bring, brought this. She said, well, what if we fidgeted consciously? Like what <laughs> if took the anxiety idea out of fidgeting? And, uh, and use that just to identify the fact that small motion has a health impact on our bodies, which is far larger than anyone realized. 
And then we got ourselves to the idea that what if we just did these beautiful little gestures consciously throughout our day? First of all, you look like a glamorous dancer, you know, which is wonderful, right? Yeah. I mean, who isn't attracted in a room when you walk in that you see a living, vital, moving person? That's, that's the life you want to go toward. Yeah, yeah, Michelle, you might want to add to some of that mm-hmm. in, in the perspective of the class and because I know many people are interested in taking it and they'll probably have a few questions right after you maybe can add a few things about what's coming up for this particular module. We're segueing beautifully because I see a, a perfect question in the chat that I want to use to illustrate what I want to say, which is the entire... <sighs> I'm not even calling it a class. Learning and healing experience is about landing in coherence and connection and then activating this native behavior of full body breathing, which is this pump that Gene is speaking of. It is this expanded, hydrated, radiant state. And then what happens is we can feel what the body is going to do, what it wants to do. It, we, I, I personally am moving incrementally in every moment. I rarely do conscious like, oh, I'm going to, unless my body says so. If I'm awake and I'm hydrated and I'm connected, all of a sudden my body's like, time to go for a walk. I want to be out on the dirt. I will actually do things I've never done. The other day, it was snowing and I took a blanket outside and I put it down. It was like the information was coming through really curly. Get down on the ground and, you know, go into this uh, hole unwinding. I mean, it was really quite eruptive. All of this energy moved and I just thought, wow, I wouldn't have discovered that if the information in my body hadn't guided me to, th- to this. So we're, it's a feel over formula space. We don't have techniques. We drop in and it's always the first time. Whatever it is that we're doing is a function of the people present and the medicine in their bodies and the consciousness that wants to come through. And really we're conditioning ourselves to expand our neural pathways and meridians so that we can actually hold this full body breathing, hydrating behavior, which is movement. We are movement. We are verbs. We are not nouns. So on that note, I want to take this question because it's a beautiful question Uh, for those with limited mobility issues, those bound in some way in hospitals, wheelchairs, et cetera, who might have physiologic challenges and serious conditions, how might they access more of the hydration and electricity you've been speaking about? Beautiful question. I want to reference the work of Emily Conrad and Valerie Hunt, Valerie Hunt, PhD, physiologists at UCLA in the 80s studied this micro movement with the help of the founder of this practice, Continuum Movement, which I affectionately name self-osteopathy. Basically what the film was that we showed, that this subtle fluctuation can happen in a meditative state, move electricity through and hydrate the tissues of in the case of these studies on people with spinal cord injury. So we're talking about paralysis and also polio victims, right? So we have extremely contracted and dense systems that responded incredibly. I'm now realizing that this is really important data that may not have been really witnessed and recently needing to come to the fore so that people realize there's no time, there's no condition, there's no Um, situation such as in a hospital bed where you cannot invoke consciousness and this awareness of your fluid self to begin to mobilize and hydrate your body regardless of your starting place. I'll pick that up too because I would like to remind people the neuroplasticity and the extraordinary research that has come out on imagining is the same to the body as doing I know of cases in which people were not able to move, but they imagined themselves moving. And thus, please thank ourselves and our bodies for where we are mobile. Enjoy it. Love it. Really amplify it. Because the joy of movement, the privilege of moving is about being alive. It's extraordinary. And we're we're blundering around as if that didn't count or it doesn't matter. But my sister's in a wheelchair, and she did, I got her to do the chin to chest and start to uh, be more in her body. And it, it's just, it, it's a pleasure. It isn't just, you know, health task, work. 
it's a pleasure. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that Continuum, you're also, Michelle, going to offer another webinar soon in January as well on breathing and, mm -hmm. and also how important that is to this particular practice. Of your it's so breathing. funny trying to separate these into topics because it's all one topic. To me, it's it like is. breathing is hydration, is, you know, conscious movement. And we're going to take, like, we have 13 modules in this class. So each one comes at the awareness and consciousness from a different angle. It's like that analogy of, you know, all these blind people touching an elephant and one says it's a trunk and one says it's a foot and when they're all right. Um, and so when we look at breathing, we're going to look at, well, one of the 13 weeks that we meet is a specific, actually, well, two, at least two are about breathing through the lens of this fundamental uh, primary and secondary respiration aspect all of it is about training ourselves to remembering how to rest in this constant state of movement, respiration, hydration, uh, awakeness, elation. It's, a, it's about aliveness. Mm -hmm. We're going to come at aliveness from focus of breath. I think we chose the date of January 12th. And I'll be joined by Robert Littman who is a phenomenal native breath connoisseur as well as continuum movement instructor and former teacher at the University of Arizona with Andy, Andy Weil. So he's, he's just agreed yesterday. So it's a very exciting thing to give you a preview of. Well, I know that we want to move it into other questions. Uh, Nicole, do you have anything that yes, you hi, can open the mic up? I, yeah. I would. I would love to open it up to Q&A. There's a couple ways you can do that. You can pop your question in the Q&A box or you can raise your hand and I can uh, give you permission the, uh, to, to speak your question. And uh, we prefer that. I know Michelle loves to engage in dialogue with you. So before we begin that, I just wanted to, I popped a few uh, links in the chat box. One was a direct link to our uh, donation page. Like I said, this year we've been hosting these 30-year anniversary events and the way that these are made possible are by your support. So if you've enjoyed today's presentation and if you gained even just a little bit of insight, which I know I have, and I know that it's been more than just a little bit. I mean, even Gina, just the tip of taking your head up and down a few times. I'm going to start doing that in all of my meetings, right? <laughs> it's something simple, simple, simple that you can incorporate into your everyday life and gain health benefits from it. So enjoyed this presentation, we would really appreciate your support. You can do that very easily by texting the 801-801, or you can follow the links in the chat box. So again, we really appreciate you. And another point that was brought up today was community. And that is something throughout our CIHS Enlightened programs that we are definitely a part of. We, we are so excited about this mind, body, spirit global community that is continuing to grow through CIHS and through amazing presenters like our ones here today. So thank you to Gina, thank you to Michelle, and thank you to Anne-Marie for coming together and exploring community. And for those of you that are new to our community, welcome, welcome. All three of us and Dr. Brophy really welcome you wholeheartedly. We are so happy that you are here and we hope that you'll continue to join us for events like these. And then one more link that I put in the box was the link to uh, Michelle's course. So she is beginning a 13-week community experience and really that's one of the underlying themes of her course is support and community. Um, breath, hydration, movement, osteopathy are all going to be part of it. So we are really excited to launch that course. Actually, today is the official launch of that course, and registration is live. So please join us or uh, feel free to reach out to myself or Michelle if you have any questions. Uh, Michelle is happy to speak with each one of you individually one-on-one -on -one if you um, are interested in joining that course. So you can schedule that with her as well. So. Yes, Michelle, if you have anything else to add about your course, um, please. Do yeah, start. I want to name what you just said is really a surprise that has come into my life that I, when I was really, really kind of living as a much more burdened being than I am now that I'm putting my attention toward this purpose of mine, which is to share this to the world. I love 
talking with people. I, I love to onboard or, you know, prepare each person for potentially participating because then we all arrive already open. And so my calendar link should be um, within this link where people can schedule a 15 minute connection call just to explore the possibility of participating, get to know each other a little bit. And I have a favorite question that's come up in the chat. Now I want to see if Brittany wants to come and ask her question live. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, for answering my question. I do Native Movement daily, um, maybe multiple times a day, and a lot of it results in popping knuckles, neck, different um, things that I feel relief from. But I feel like there might also be a better and more love movement that I could adopt instead. Or uh, what do you, yeah, just thoughts on this. I love this question so much. When we're thawing the body, this happens in different ways in different parts. So I observe this in every patient I've ever treated for 20 years. It's very specific. We'll have partially thawed areas beginning to become um, more heightened in contrast with the areas that are coming along more slowly. And so some of that contrast can actually bring in a little bit of the, the um, well, some instability, honestly, in the course of thawing. We're no longer where we started, and we haven't yet arrived in a fully integrated substance-like way of being. This dissolving, is, it's really about a deeper integrating osmotically, if we're talking fluid dynamics, into one harmonious blended substance. And so I think it's beautiful that you're outside and being supported by the grounding and power of the earth to support your thawing process. And I don't worry about it so much as a, yes, the popping is dramatic and it's calling you to, oh, further integration blending is called for maybe a little bit more of a, a little bit of a deepening of a dissolving and a little bit more of a integrating of the structural and the energetic. And honestly, that has accomplished most powerfully in community um, I name this as a specific thing because we're, we're in a Zoom room, we're all entrained to one another, and then what happens is there's so much more power, there's more intelligence, there's more holding, it's safer. So it's not only is it a way to accelerate the process of thawing and integrating, it's safer, it's beautifully held, it's also more pleasurable and enjoyable because of the sense of holding and connection. It's the, the connection element, the communal element is really the missing piece to how it is that we learn and share information. And then I wanted to say that the safety piece is, piece is really huge, but also the enjoyment of every moment and the remaining in this connected and trained state, even when we move through academic topics. The entire thing is cultivating our systems to actually grow into the ability to hydrate and share information in this deeply grounded and integrated way. Thank you. Can I add something to that, Brittany? Yeah. I don't know if you use chia seeds. Part <laughs> of my research on desert foods that hydrate, I came across the, the desert plant chia, and it's a plant already releasing the gel form. The seeds release this jelly-like, plasma-like liquid and hydration. And if you ingest those, it almost goes right to your joints. You know, it's just one of those amazing foods to support us. And then I really like a, a chia pudding, which is um, my go-to recipe. I just love it. It's a, a simple can of coconut milk and five tablespoons, and you'll remember five because you have five fingers, of chia seeds. <laughs> and you put them in a bowl and you go mix, 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 and so they don't clump. Come back in five minutes, mix, mix, mix. You know, that's good for three or four servings. I love to, I love to share that, especially for people at night so that they have nighttime hydration, but they don't have liquid, so they don't have to get up and pee all the time during the middle of the night. These are great strategies to, uh, again, 
this is plant information coming into our life. And if you're outside doing native movement, there's a whole world conspiracy around you on um, the grass, the trees who are also loving and caring for you. And they love when you pay attention to them. <laughs> it just Thank you so much. I, I just bought it. some chia seeds and um, that recipe is just what I needed. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. I think it adds to everything Michelle was saying. Oh, I, I, uh, I live on, on chia. I love it. I think of it as time release um, water, just as you said, because the way that the chia see it, see it expands, it actually becomes a holder of gel water. So mm -hmm. imagine it's like this reaching, you know, the lining of your intestines and then seeping slowly into this gradual thawing. And also that the bacteria love it. It's a prebiotic. It's food to create mm -hmm. a healthy microbiome. And it's extremely cleansing. Perfect. That sounds so good. I love chia pudding. It's been a long time, but I'm happy to serve it to my grandma now for that reason that you described. Plus, I love chia pudding with rose and cardamom. <gasps> I want to bring some of that floral yeah. into mm -hmm. her diet. <laughs> Lovely. The connection experience to be had there. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your wonderful question. Thank you all. Our question is, do you, feel, do you have experience with restless leg limb syndrome where the person feels compelled to move throughout the day? I have a client who experiences this need that interrupts his sleep but occurs all day long. It seems like a sympathetic state. Are there resources for better understanding this kind of movement? It's about breathing and hydration, right? Because a lot of restless limb can be about mineral imbalance, right? And the water carries the minerals. The hydrated body is able to absorb minerals. We actually know that the consuming water in the form of chia or structured water or water that you've prayed over can actually transport nutrients across the cell wall. So our nutrient status that has everything to do with how the ner nervous system is functioning or not functioning is supported by hydrating in all the ways we've talked about. And then this sympathetic excess, which exists in restless leg is one particular form, it exists in all of us, is a function of this non-integration between the physical and subtle body. Because when we come into this coupling of the primary breath, the breath and the subtle body and the physical breath, the nervous system comes right down. And the minute we land in and live in coherence, full body breathing and hydration as a behavior and look at what my hands are doing, this is who we are. We're this constantly expanding and contracting presence in concert with the forces of nature and the planet Earth that... We're basically, I'm describing like, oh, let me flush my tissues like a wetland. Let me tonify and heal my nervous system. Let me bring the nutrients in and the waste products out. And the <laughs> healing is breathing, right? Healing is an extension of breathing, movement, hydration. And so when that stayed expanded and hydrated, fully expressed respiratorily speaking, if that's not happening, the list of diagnoses is limitless. Ultimately, the, the body's not able to mobilize its self-healing capability. So however it is, you find your way back to thawing, breathing, integration, you're going to be improving any health condition. Let's see. And I've learned that mostly all water sources, unfortunately, have pollution at this time. Given the radioactivity of Fukushima having re reached California shores, pharmaceuticals in our home water, and heated plastic, bo plastic bottled water leaching into the water, would you agree that to eliminate all of these, that a distiller is the only true way to restore the innocence of water, and Ooh. then adding minerals to enliven and add information before ingesting? Thanks. This is an anonymous question. Want me to go with that one, Gina? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we look at the bench science, when the water is infused with electricity, it's a gel matrix. And that gel matrix is, a, it actually ejects particulate 
impurities and they change, they shift form. And so we're collecting the science on how it is that, and I don't know how to respond to this in terms of radiation, honestly, if anyone else has an idea of this, but the concept underneath it is that the gel matrix ejects the impurities. We often see that what they do is complex to one another, and then they become less injurious to the body. For instance, fluoride can attach to itself and become inert or less absorbable, less injurious to the body. And then anytime we bring in consciousness and coherence and potent, healthy, uh, resonant states, we are able to alchemize and neutralize any impurity. I mean, that's the basis of ener energy medicine. Mm -hmm. That's the basis of Joe Dispenza's work. That's the basis of how is it that we actually can, you know, transform and heal and detoxify simply by the purity and uh, focus scale presence of our awareness. We're getting into some deep concepts here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So structuring, so few people have said, of course, if you distill water and it's more pure, and what if you do reverse osmosis, it's more, more pure, but it's dead. Can I add minerals in it? Will, will it be conscious again? I don't know how to say that. I would say, I would say that's a function of intention and your awareness and even the choosing of the minerals and the concentrations that you put back in. But fundamentally, we're looking to restore to nature's perfection which is what gina had mentioned earlier so you want to mention something about that gina yeah i think one feature that we didn't discuss because we were focused on the electrical and the informational right. I, I want you to think of water on a spectrum you know it's vapor it's liquid it's this gel more dense state and then if it, there's cold present it becomes ice um, and ice shows us what water's doing right before it turns into ice. It's this crystal state. It's extraordinary. It's a liquid crystal. And in that state, so liquid is not a liquid crystal. <laughs> Only the plasma state is a liquid crystal. And as water moves through this spectrum, its own hydrological cycle, when it hits the gel or plasma state, and it's always seeking to get there because that's how water purifies itself water can clean itself up and yeah. it's been doing that since the planet started <laughs> so since the cosmos started so that's a really important piece of information that we didn't get to really lay on the table water has a state in which it cleans itself so if we can help water move towards that state we're also ingesting the benefits of that as well and that's why I often will help people understand water and food is already in that state. So get a lot of hydration from fresh fruits and vegetables. That's, that's an important thing. But then, of course, we still have the liquid and how do we get clean liquid story. And distilling, you know, it, it puts water through those properties, but it also creates sort of a blank slate. So drinking blank slate water isn't great you want to bring back some materials into that water that it can now have a partner to have the conversation and to grow itself. And that involves things like tea, <laughs> you know, putting a bag of tea in a bottle <laughs> is um, now the, the plants are talking to the water and there's a liveliness going on that wasn't there before. If you put a pinch of salt in your water, it is so profound. It's amazing. Salt uh, is a, and of course we want to talk about a good salt, like, um, you know, not from the salt shakers, but those sea salts or organic salts, rock salts, desert salts, um, all of these salts are um, important because they not only have a conversation with the water, but they start an electrical charge going, um, as do all plants, but salt in particular. So I always drink my water when I am drinking a glass of water. I actually go around with a little Ziploc bag of, of pink salt that I have that I just put a pinch in my glass if I'm at a restaurant. And then I, I think that helping understand on the radiation question, uh, just a straightforward, really helpful thing to know is that clays, minerals and clays are incredibly powerful. They're meant to be really in relationship with water. They love water. So uh, when I come home from a long airplane trip, and I know I've been exposed to a lot of radiation, I'll always take a bentonite clay bath. I'll just throw in a cup, um, swish around in that water. It, it, I don't even think you need a whole cup. 
sometimes when I'm at a hotel and they don't have a bathtub and I'm at the shower, I put some clay in my hand and I just rub it all over, <laughs> wash it down the drain. These are just really straightforward uses of biological principles that allow us to help clean up our environment and our own waters. The next question I always get right after that is, well, what about the microplastics in the salts or in the world now? You know, again, in understanding yourself as a moving water being means these things come in, but with the right movement, hydration, intention, great diet, cheerfulness. Cheerfulness does a huge amount of work on microplastics. <laughs> I'm sorry to put it that way, but you are a flow system. You are going to be assaulted. Things are going to come in and they, and by virtue of a whole way of knowing about yourself, they're going to flow back on out. So, um, so I think that's a, a beautiful conversation that we've kind of laid open to begin to explore for each of yourselves of being so resilient. It, whatever flows towards you, you're just going to be able to fluidly handle and, and apply mercy to it, right? Agreed. Beautiful. I would consider the resonant state the harmonizer and that if we're able to not only embody a coherent resonant state but a powerful one, we become neutralizers not only for our own bodies and but, but for others. And, and in holding those states, we help others remember how to embody those states. And then on a practical level, I wanted to say some people have talked about Chia, putting Chia on their cereal. Uh, it has to be hydrated overnight, Gina named. A lot of people think, oh, Chia, they'll just throw it into things, but it actually needs to be hydrated. And then this other practical question of early in our looking at different technologies for water structuring and purifying, I put one on my whole house. And so not only did I notice my plants so much happier, so much more quickly, and my gardener said, wow, when I take this water and I put it into really hard pan soil that normally takes this, you know, repeated drenching in order to really loam up again, it's, it, he's like, it just goes, it's just going right in. This transmissibility based on the lower surface tension. And then what happened was I do have a carbon block filtration device on my kitchen sink, but... I had undrinkable water in the bathroom upstairs and I put one of the whole house device 40 feet away from this upstairs bathroom, rendered this water beautifully drinkable. Ultimately, if the situation is complex, we send the water in for testing. Great. Beautiful. That wasn't as fun of a topic. Ah. <laughs> Uh, well, I, can we make it fun? I, I just, I'm kind of dying to say something. Yeah, do something <laughs> to make great, that great, one great. fun. <laughs> um, the water unit next to your upstairs bathroom is the same thing as going on when you walk on the ocean. When you're on Absolutely. the ocean, you are picking up. In, now you really get water's information, right? When you're walking on that sand and the uh, ocean that is making huge amounts of electrical charge, People you call it, usually they call it, oh, those, that's the negative ions. I never, I couldn't understand. That didn't do anything for me. I, I didn't turn me on to be in the presence of negative ions. I, I just, but, but being in the presence of the frequencies that were being released, and now we get to just slightly turn the conversation like we brought you to the electrical conversation. We brought you to the you're a body of water conversation. Oh my gosh. We brought you to the water as information and now we're just going to let you know that water as information comes in as frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Brittany, when we were talking about you being outside and, and having your, your feet on the grass, the, that grass is releasing a frequency. And, and in the Native traditions, the, the way they would speak about that is the grass is singing its song to you. And this is a whole way of being of starting to collect all the songs that are being sung to us that were previously silenced because we didn't know that grass could sing to us and share its passionate love for humans. I mean, there is a conversation that's happening around the planet about how we are the apex species, which is trashing everything. And yes, that's true, but there's a deeper truth, which is all of the planets, all of the living creatures are conspiring to help us they're there for us. They want to help us. They know it will help all of them as well. So 
relying on our uh, hearing the singing of the other living things that love us and want to care for us and that we want to respond to. This is a completely different way of living. So when you're at the ocean and the, the song of the ocean, literally we hear the song of the ocean is coming in. We're receiving that dramatically. So we get it. And then we can transfer that experience to when we're walking the, the path on the pine needles or someone brings us a bouquet of flowers and we get that they're singing to us, that they are conspiring mm-hmm. to help us because we're all living creatures and all living creatures want to help the creature next to them to be in relationship. So sound is also hydrating and we, I, we're not going to get to open that larger question except in the course, but at least we got that information to you and you can begin to activate that in your life. You use a lot of sound and frequencies to cope with the crazy world we live in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina, for resuscitating the space. It's so funny. I went into this, oh, I have to answer all the questions. And then I went up here and then I was like, I felt the whole, it's wonderful though, because we actually depart from coherence in order to exercise the muscle of coming Mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. So that's all of it. And I'm feeling just so inspired by what you just shared. (laughs) Oh, receiving the song in every moment. (laughs) And I, and I remember now a story my, one of my mentors, Dr. Jim Jealous, told about his mentor who lived five miles from the ocean, an elder osteopathic doctor. She could feel it when the tide shifted. Her system was that attuned to these, right? That harmonized with the larger forces of nature. We're all capable of that. I love how you're naming how our imaginations really just need to get on board with what's true and what's possible. That's the beginning of our learning. Mm-hmm. Well, I think at this point, that's a nice place to wrap it all up. And I'm just going to share my screen real quick with the information on Michelle's upcoming course. Uh, you can join us starting at the end of January, right and start for the new year to help you with cultivating resilience through 2023 and exploring all of these fascinating topics. So we appreciate you for being here. Thank you to Gina. Thank you to Anne-Marie. Thank you to Michelle. And thank you to all of you who are in attendance today. Thank you for your donation. And we look forward to sharing more on this topic throughout Michelle's course. And also you can mark the date on your calendar for Thursday, 9 a.m., January 12th. And Michelle will be doing one more of these webinars exploring breath. So... I don't know. I think we might need to add another one on sound, too. We <laughs> might need to. Yes, we just touched on that very big topic. <laughs> very big topic. We could go on and on. And I want to say also, as a trustee of CIHS, I, uh, I really feel that when uh, I was brought to the attention of, of Michelle's work, and I've certainly known Gina's work even before, this is the kind of a school, or I should say teachings that we would love to have represent the school. This is, it it speaks on many levels of learning. And I love the fact that laboratory work is part of that encompassed. And I also want to say thank you to these extraordinary 30 year anniversary of public education programs that both Nicole and Thomas have put together. It's mm-hmm. been enlightening and it certainly encourages the values of what uh, Dr. Motiyama has always inspired, which is bringing spirituality and science as a conversation together. And this is what it represents. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank, yeah, you. thank you so much, Gina, Michelle, and Anne-Marie. This was really fascinating and very much like you described, Anne-Marie, uh, in line with CHS's mission. So uh, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you all. We hope to see you again soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.